Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for being here. And a special thanks to the Wigan family for making this event possible. As you know, in my talk tonight, I'm crossing two disciplines, narrative and neuroscience, but I'm also aware that in this room, there are multiple disciplines. And so I'm hoping that I will get some good feedback from you from your particular perspective on how you might relate to the issues that I'm talking about. 35 years ago, I believe, the first speaker to discuss literature in this memorial series was Northrop Fry. And I'm honored, indeed humbled, to be following in his footsteps. But I'm also here to propose that the paths of the arts and sciences have changed over the intervening years, and that our disciplinary footsteps are now more often converging and crossing rather than apart. Professor Fry's talk was, of course, brilliant, but it made no direct reference to science. Instead, protesting against the excessive rationality and analytic philosophy and the excessive irrationality of the government, Fry upheld the humanities as the matrix of civilization, arguing that literature through the unifying power of the imagination balances reason and feeling in the harmonious self. Imagination plays a central role in my talk today as well, but as I hope to show, imagination is becoming increasingly a shared aesthetic and scientific concern. While the contrasting sites of the experimental lab and the humanist study still reflect our different primary methodologies, the questions we pose are often remarkably the same. The integrative space, I suggest, has shifted from the purview of one discipline into a multidisciplinary border zone. In what follows, I'll be stretching beyond habitual academic structures through crossings of narrative and neuroscience, with, I expect, all the shakiness that extreme stretching involves. But my thoughts are not meant as conclusive findings. Instead, they are offered at what, as what an interdisciplinary collection on memory calls an interim report on an intellectual dialogue. My work at the borders of narrative and neuroscience began one fateful day when, in writing about William James, I paused to ask, what do neuroscientists think of James now? My journey began with a 1993 article delightfully entitled Beyond the Fringe. Amused by its gentle humor, I was also intrigued by the argument that James was right in positing the existence of fringe awareness, but wrong in his terminology, since fringe suggests something vague and peripheral, whereas the experience can be powerful and all-consuming. As this article developed into a dialogue between two neuroscientists, David Galen and Russell Epstein, the issues related increasingly with my own work. Although Galen and Epstein were arguing that James's fringe takes different forms, the relevance of their basic subject to what narrative study, also using Jamesian terminology, has termed stream of consciousness, was clear. Fringe experiences reach beyond or behind our conscious conceptual understandings, offering what Epstein characterized as the pulsate rhythms of thought. James himself referred to psychic transitions always on the wing, so to speak, and not to be glimpsed except in flight. Reflecting on her work as a writer, Virginia Woolf echoed his words. I attain a different kind of beauty from painting, showing all the traces of the mind's passage through the world, some kind of whole made of shivering fragments, the flight of the mind. Skipping from Wolf to neuroscience, we find Kalina Kristoff's lab at UBC pursuing a similar question today. The development of a neurophenomenological approach may one day unfurl the mystery that captivated William James more than a century ago. What did the flights of mind look like, and can we ever observe them? The approach I'm pursuing seeks to connect the flight of the mind to how we imagine space. Writing in the year 2000, Epstein speculated that as internal processes rather than as responses to external stimuli, Fringe experiences would lie, rely on our associative memory networks and thus on the medial temporal lobe and in particular, the hippocampus. 
At the time, it was well established that the hippocampus plays the role in both spatial navigation and episodic memory. And so Epstein speculated on a possible evolutionary link, that the hippocampus, phylogenetically the oldest part of the brain, originally supported external navigation, but later evolved to support internal navigation. Transposing the possibility of such connections to narrative, my first study in the area concerned the way fictional characters who loitered, wandered about, or otherwise performed random navigational movements were often mentally uncoding habitual responses and opening up space where new perceptions could arise. In the years since Galen's and Epstein's primary reflections, studies of the hippocampus have introduced complexities and the networks involved in spatial navigation and episodic memory have been shown not precisely to overlap. Yet both activities require a functioning hippocampus to work. A common dependency suggests a process in common. And Eleanor McGuire and her colleagues at the Wellcome Trust argue that scene construction is the link. It has long been assumed that the core function of the hippocampus is to bind together events in narrative time whether in past or future episodic thinking. Maguire and colleagues found a similar reliance on the hippocampus when we imagine non-self-related fictitious scenes. But they further discovered that at least some amnesiac patients with hippocampal deficits can connect events in a sequence, but unlike normal subjects, cannot imagine in any detail the place where they occurred. If the ability to imagine a rich internal representation depends on an intact hippocampus, McGuire's team argued, then the core activity of the hippocampus might be, rather than temporal binding, the construction of spatially coherent scenes. And you may be able to detect in the center of their diagram a little drawing of a seahorse, uh, the origin of the name hippocampus. The evidence is still inconclusive and like any academic work, neuroscience is rife with controversies and debates. Neuroscientists divide on the question whether the core function of the hippocampus concerns space or time. But for the analysis of literary nar narrative, what matters most are the interdependencies between cognitive processes that are being hypothesized and explored. Imagining space seems to be crucial for constructing stories, whether past, future, <clears throat> or fictitious. Yet literary narrative is generally defined as a meaningful progression of events, and description, assumed to be static, is assigned to a background, supportive role. I argue a more organic role for description. Complementing the narrative plot of external events, description, I propose, can offer a narrative of process in which the unfolding events are cognitive. Furthermore, by exercising our spatial imaginations, we as readers can participate in this unfolding process too. I'm referring not to the way a reader might analyze a description, but to the way a reader can, through reading description, have the actual bodily experience of being in the narrative's imagined space. It's fairly evident that we can construct a mental representation of a scene from reading the description of it. But can the internalized image actually activate physical experience? And can that physical experience lead us to experience changing cognitive events? Neuroscientific evidence indicates that it can. In Adrian Owen's lab, fMRIs of subjects asked to imagine specific movements showed different patterns of brain activity depending on the kind of movement involved. Furthermore, the brain activations when imagining movement were indistinguishable from those for performing the action in real life. Here, the left-hand side of the picture illustrates how being asked to imagine walking through one's home activates areas known to be implicated in topographical navigational tasks. The right-hand side indicates that being asked to imagine playing tennis triggers robust activity in the supplementary motor area instead. Imagined movement can give us the experience of making that movement. Additionally, since our brains can distinguish between different movements, descriptions of changing movements 
can give us the experience of fluid and mobile cognitive events. Shifting among different spaces and movements requires some cognitive flexibility, bringing me to the primary question underlying my talk today. How do we acquire the ability not only to generate new ideas, but more radically to think in new ways? Can the cognitive flexibility experienced in reading complex narrative descriptions translate into cognitive flexibility in our lives? Again, neuroscientists seem to be asking the same question and with some fascinating results. Daniel Schachter and colleagues have found that subjects who are given preliminary training in observing and recalling rich detail when watching a short video perform better than control subjects on tests for divergent thinking, defined as the capacity to generate creative ideas by combining diverse types of information in new ways. Improving, ep improving episodic memory, they conclude, contributes to creative thinking. But it's instructive to note that the training video they describe presents a man and woman performing various activities in a house and that training involves mental imagery exercises in which subjects close their eyes and generate a picture in their minds about the setting, people, and actions they had seen. As McGuire argues in her work on scene construction, recalling past experience requires us to locate that experience in a place. Matter, Addis, and Schachter's experiments similarly, similarly suggest that spatial imagination is an important component in recollection and that furthermore, richness of detail in our mental imagery makes us more likely to go beyond habit and think in new ways. In what follows, I'll be approaching these issues from the standpoint of narratology, asking what fictional narratives might tell us about the links among bodily experience, scene construction, and conceptual modes. My underlying premise is that reading and remembering narrative description can exercise our spatial imagination enhancing our cognitive flexibility and our capacities for thinking in new ways. My examples come from my own area of modernist, li modernist literature, a period when interest in cognitive processes was particularly strong. But the three visual moves I discuss could appear in descriptive narratives of all kinds. First, narrowing or widening the view with a corresponding alteration in scale. Secondly, shifting rapidly through different kinds of scenes. And third, building a composite and layered cognitive map. Not all examples take us to fringe experience, but each in some way illustrates the flight of the mind. And since each is informed by crossings between narrative and neuroscience, they suggest ways of getting beyond the habit of opposing arts and science and opening up possibilities for dialogue and exchange. Part one, altering scale. Following Epstein's linkage of physical and mental navigation, David Galen reflected on a theory he named the perceptual motor basis of abstract thought. If the theory held true, he speculated, <clears throat> then the same neuronal systems that control the hand to transform the position of a berry from on the bush to in the mouth would also play a role in mentally extracting a single element from a narrative and putting it into the appropriate category. Leaving aside the question of exact neural overlap, Galen's basic concept finds support today as embodied cognition. In its weak form, the understanding that language develops from physical analogies. In its strong form, the idea that bodily experiences can directly shape our thoughts. Lawrence Barcelo, for example, argues that sensory modalities and proprioception are fully a conceptual system, capable of producing categorical inferences, organizing experiences into conceptual structures, and advancing propositions. Image and body schemas, that is, can become conceptual schemas. Movements that articulate patterns can be translated into the strategies we use in our lives. Experiments with problem solving show in numerous ways how this works. To take a simple example, psychologists at Cornell studied the eye movements of students presented with a classic insight problem first posed by Carl Duncker in 1945. 
How can you treat an inoperable tumor that can only be eradicated by intense radiation when a laser of sufficient strength to destroy the cancer would destroy surrounding tissue as well? To visualize the problem, students were given a diagram, which you see here, representing the tumor as a small black oval surrounded by a white area of tissue inside a larger oval whose circumference represented skin. Tracking the eye movements of the students as they studied the diagram, the experimenters discovered that those who solved the problems generally looked at a point outside the circumference of the skin, then at the tumor in the center, then at a different point outside the circumference, cross-cutting the image in different directional ways. And their crisscrossing eye movements simulated the solution. Multiple lasers of low intensity could target the tumor from different angles, exposing tissue to low intensity radiation, but converging at the center to concentrate high radiation on the tumor itself. Showing the transposition from bodily to conceptual schema even more clearly, Subjects who were first prompted to make crisscrossing eye movements in an unrelated activity did better at solving the problem than subjects without the prompt. Eye movements can become thought, bringing us to the effect of a reader's eye movements when reading narrative description. My examples concern a technique that film technology has made almost second nature to us today, zooming in and zooming out with corresponding shifts between close and distant views. Narratological analysis commonly describes such effects as shifts in focalization. But my approach goes further to ask how cognitive activity changes when we widen or narrow our views. What matters, of course, is both the size of the image and what the image is, as we literally see in the opening descriptions of Arnold Bennett's The Old Wives' Tale and E.M. Forster's A Passage to India. The old wives' tale begins with a panoramic, panoramic aerial view of England, then zooms in shot by shot until we focus on the two main female characters and what they see. From the broad mapping of England and its rivers, we close in on the county of Staffordshire, then on the district of the, small, of the five towns, then to one of those towns, then to a square in the town, to a shop in that square, and finally, to a window in the shop. Our eye movements shift from initially stretching to increasingly narrowing visual perception, from initially seeing through an impersonal topographical map to a particularized individual view. In contrast, a passage to India opens with a close-up focus on the lower level of Chandrapur, with its houses, bazaars, and mud tilts upward to the hospital, civil station, gardens, and the English club on the hill above, then zooms out to the sky, its blending tints, the stars, and eventually the distance beyond the stars. We shift from the detail of near perception, in which we note, for example, that the club is built of red, club is built of red bricks, to the intangibility of distance, moving beyond the blue of the sky to a realm where color, since we are now imaginatively beyond eyesight, no longer exists. At the end of the passage, our eyes lower to traverse the distant land's seemingly limitless flatness, where the only forms on the horizon, the Marabar Caves, seem as equally inaccessible and unknowable as the sky. Although operating in reverse, these graduated shifts in scale call upon the reader's cognitive flexibility, and in both novels, eye movements alter our conceptual frames. Close-up detailed views ground us in the predominantly naturalistic perception that obtains throughout the narratives, in which we observe behavior, feel sympathy or dislike, analyze character, and reflect on social relationships, employing the ordinary day-to-day -day cognitive interactions that we find of use in our, in our own lives. Conversely, the distanced views set such perceptions in counterpoint against perspectives imagined from a non-human position. Both Bennett and Forster use distanced views to remove us from the comfort zone of a human-centered world proportioned to our bodily scale. As these narratives unfold, one view does not supplant the other, 
toggling between emotional involvement in the human story and a perception of the fragility and indeed in consequence of human stories in relation to the larger elemental forces beyond individual life. But while in each novel the distant views are focalized without a human observer, there's a crucial difference between Bennett's factual and Forster's imaginative mode. Bennett's distant perspective stretches our minds to geographical expanse, but we, re we remain within the frame of a knowable world. Even his distance description includes detail about particular geographic features, such as a hill infamous in the history of primitive Methodism. Taking such narrative license, normally increased distance would mean less detailed perception, Bennett keeps our eyes on a realist social world, making his readers aware of the broader geographical, historical, and cultural environments that his characters, who might be described today as Brexit little Englanders, ignore. By contrast, Forster's technique for perceptually expanding the universe reduces clarity and lessens specificity. The eye is bathed in the subtly changing colors of the sky, then drawn out to its limitless underlying core of blue, and finally lost in an undifferentiated expanse beyond color. And you might be interested that I took this image of, of, to represent Forster's distance view from an issue of National Geogra Geographic, and it's from an article entitled, What Does Nothing Look Like? Forster's distance goes epistemologically further than Bennett's, taking us into regions of the mind where there are no anchors, where there is only space and no place, where we literally become lost in thought. Both writers exercise the reader's cognitive spatial flexibility, but Forster's takes the mind into cognitively unknowable realms. Whereas Bennett's focus remains sociological, Forster's expands from the sociological to the epistemological and metaphysical. Moving beyond rational conscious perception, Forster invokes perceptions that lie on the fringe. Part two, changing scenes. In my first examples of spatial cognition, a narrator guides the reader's imagined eye movements, stimulating a move from flexible seeing to flexible thinking. In this section, I shift to the thoughts of a fictional character and the shifts in his imagination through numerous rapidly changing scenes. And as in the passage from Forster, my next example takes us to James's fringe perception, an experience we may subjectively recognize, but which in its elusiveness seems beyond tracking to its neural source. In the 1990s, however, a pivotal moment occurred when experimenters discovered that subjects showed a surprising, surprising decrease in neural activity when they moved from a resting state to perform a requested task. Evidently, we expend large amounts of mental energy in supposed rest, leading Marcus Rakel and his colleagues to refer to the brain's dark energy and to coin the term default mode network for the regions of the brain involved. What was first identified as a single network is now understood to be a complex of overlapping hubs and subsystems, adding much to the complexity of my work. You'll remember how I began with the hippocampus, that little piece of green. The default network includes the hippocampus, but it has shrunk to being a small component of the larger hippocampal formation, the area HF plus at the bottom of the screen, which in turn represents a small portion of the multiple regions and various linkages in the default system that the different colors depict. As a whole, nonetheless, the default network, here shown in yellow-orange, is distinct from the regions for visual attention, shown in blue with the attentional areas responsible for extrin extrinsic thinking or responses to the external world, and the default areas activated in intrinsic thinking or spontaneous thought. Despite the independent and somewhat oppositional nature of the default and attentional networks, however, they usually don't function in isolation. Some estimates are that in ordinary life, we toggle between them every 20 seconds. <laughs> 
The shift from brain net regions to networks has expanded scientific work from isolating dedicated functions to mapping connectivities. This schematic diagram separates the networks according to their discrete roles, showing the default network in blue, the attentional network in red, and the frontal parietal control network in green. But the connecting lines indicate the mutual interdependencies that can be activated in our thoughts. The default network is not quite the bit of consciousness spinning off in autopilot that Epstein once envisioned. Yet it still has a distinct role and one specifically tied to internally generated thought. And although some internal thinking is goal-oriented, requiring attentional assist, not so the Jamesian flight of the mind. If we're planning how to conduct ourselves in an upcoming job interview, our introspective thinking engages a practical real-world task. However, other forms of intrinsic thinking, such as dreaming, exploratory mind-wandering, and holistic mindfulness, set aside immediate goals and suspend, at least temporarily, logical conscious control. Correspondingly, attention-oriented mindfulness has been linked to reduced activations in the default network, whereas non-directive meditation, which allows spontaneously occurring thoughts and images to emerge and pass freely, shows increased default network activity instead. Unconstrained mental flights may rely on regions of the default network functioning more actively and for longer durations on their own. A big question is what is neurologically happening in these less conscious conditions when we're in a state called active rest? Does a greater reliance on the default network give a specific character to our thoughts? Studies in computational neuroimaging from Imperial College London argue that the attentional network is characterized by synchrony or maintaining consistent network configurations over a period of time, whereas the default network is characterized by metastability or multiple transient connections. Synchrony supports attention with robust and stable connections, but at the cost of reduced information capacity. Contrastingly, metastability's varying configurations compensate for lesser control with increased information capacity. Stable attentional forms of connectivity would facilitate task completion, whereas dynamic and changing default connectivities would enable the experiences that I have by default been calling the fringe. Not surprisingly, most neuroscientific work, even on internal thought, focuses on goal-oriented tasks, which are easier to replicate in the experimental lab. To access fringe experience, we have to rely on subjective reporting. And while neuroscientists are beginning to work with first-person autobiographical accounts, I'm arguing that fictional narratives are an immensely rich resource. While such accounts are, of course, hypothetical, when novelists are cognitively observant, their works may offer what I call experience-based knowledge of how cognition works. Virginia Woolf, as I've mentioned, sought throughout her career to record the flight of the mind, perhaps nowhere more precisely and minutely than her 1925 novel, Mrs. Dalloway. As we shall see, even a single paragraph from this novel takes a character's mind through myriad cognitive shifts, and I'll be tracking those shifts much in the way neuroscientists Eleanor McGuire and Hugo Spears use thought bubbles to track the thoughts reported by London taxi drivers as they navigate in virtual reality through the city's streets. But whereas the thoughts of the taxi drivers were almost all task-driven plans about route planning, the thoughts of Wolf's character show a mind moving through spatial imagination out of habitual responses to the liberating effects of the fringe. In this episode, Peter Walsh, a minor figure in the British civil service in India, is back in London and walking to his hotel. Since Peter knows this area of the city well, he can loiter on the street and mind wander with relative safety, not needing like the taxi drivers to focus on a challenging task. The first trigger for his thinking is an external stimulus, the sound of an ambulance bell. And it's his immediate response is habitual social conditioning, one of the triumphs of civilization, he thinks. 
characteristically evaluating his world through the imperial frame. But from there, Peter's mind performs an amazing number of cognitive shifts, over 20 in all, and almost all of them constructing imagined scenes. Engaging perhaps the metastability of the default network, the mind, his mind moves from the probable to the possible to the fantastical in groupings beginning like this. Imagining something that has happened, an accident. Imagining something similar happening to himself, being struck by a car. Imagining what others on the street might be thinking, themselves laid out in stretchers. And imagining what is happening beyond the frame of what he can see, the ambulance speeding away. Peter's mind is rapidly casting up a series of hypothetical scenarios that shift gradually from self-relevance -rel to other related views. Then suddenly his mind leaps into radically different and seemingly unconnected modes. First, a memory. In a sudden flash, Peter thinks back to his visit with Clarissa Dalloway that morning. And then, just as suddenly, a dreamscape. In a semi-conscious state between sleep and awake, Peter imagines a surrealist scene that lacks all direct or logical connection to his previous thoughts. The language becomes weirdly imagistic, tracing the drip, drip of one impression after another down into that cellar where they stood, deep, dark, and no one would ever know. Who are they? Where is that cellar? Peter's thought, if it can be called thought, loses coherence and explicable re re reference. He enters a state of mind marked by a complete departure from external reality and suggesting the elusive, inarticulate realms of the fringe. Significantly, the change in Peter's scene construction is accompanied by an emotional and cognitive shift. Behind Peter's mind wandering is a background of remote concerns, a trouble repressed from his conscious thoughts, but rising to the surface as his visualizations become increasingly free. All day, he's been wrestling with his emotions about Clarissa, anger mixed inextricably with love. But when he shifts into a dreamscape, his warring emotions and exhaustion are suddenly dispelled by the exhilaration of a moment in which things came together, this ambulance and life and death. Going beyond his first outburst of categorical imperialist certainty, Peter comes to an acceptance of uncertainty, indefinability, and ambiguity, a holistic state of mind in which contraries are not dispelled but sustained. Unlike the sense of threat and unease generated in Forster's scene of undifferentiated vision, Peter's visionary moment brings him release. The effect, again imagined in a visual scene, is a wiping clean. It was as if he were sucked up to some very high roof by that rush of emotions, and the rest of him, like a white shell-sprinkled beach, left bare. And the image schema behind Peter's change is the turn First, a physical movement in the present scene. And yet, thought Peter, as the ambulance turned the corner, his thought, beginning itself to turn with and yet, then embraces the turn as conceptual schema, as he apprehends life as an unknown garden full of turns and corners. Peter's mind opens to the unknowable and the unexpected, and the move releases him from the burdensome centrality of the self. Significantly, at the end of the novel, Peter turns a corner in relation to Clarissa as well. He abandons his attempts to categorize her and instead holistically experiences her multiform full presence as she enters the room. As cognitive theory, Wolf's representation of thought suggests the transformative potentials of the default mode, especially in what's known as creativity's incubation phase. In a study conducted by Melissa Elamil in Kalina Kristoff's lab, for example, fMRIs of subjects who'd been asked to design book covers showed default mode predominance in the first stage of generating images and ideas. In the later phases of elaboration and evaluation, default and attentional networks were jointly recruited in the task. As studies in episodic training from Daniel Schachter's lab suggests, 
the detailed imagery in Peter's spatial imagination may spur his divergent thinking. But Wolf is also suggesting that letting our minds slip freely through multiple scene constructions can stimulate holistic fringe perception and enable creative leaps. Part three, building cognitive maps. From shifting through different scenes, I turn in my last example to the accumulative construction through a narrative of a cognitive map. In neuroscience, a cognitive map refers to a physical representation of space in the mind. In narratology, to a mental model of narrative space. Both definitions ground the map securely in the physical world. But if image schemas are at the same time conceptual schemas, then the map is more than a diagram of space. In Mrs. Dalloway, Wolfe's mapping of London offered the 1920s a new way of imagining the modern city. And I'm arguing that it can continue to stimulate our models of urban space today. Wolfe's imaginative schema does mean stretching the reader's mapping capacities in ways that might stretch some critic's belief. But three relatively recent developments in neuroscience suggest that such mental gymnastics can be performed. The first complexity in Wolf's mapping interfaces egocentric and allocentric views. In the language of spatial cognition, egocentric refers not to pride, but to representations from the perspective of a particular perceiver. Allocentric, literally other-centered, signifies a perceptual frame external to any observer's position. Previously, it was thought that the brain stores only egocentric maps from the perspective of the self as observer, and that allocentric or viewer-independent maps were accessed in forms outside the brain, like the atlas. But reflecting, for example, the way we're able to imagine a familiar space approached from angles we haven't actually seen, Neil Burgess and colleagues have shown that allocentric maps can be stored in the brain and accessed from multiple imagined sides. Egocentric and allocentric involve parallel systems and different neural networks, but they can be interfaced and combined. A second complexity in cognitive mapping involves interactions between place cells and grid cells. Simply put, place cells help us to identify and remember landmarks and objects. Grid cells constitute a positioning system, helping us to locate our bodies in space. Narratology separates these two dimensions into different categories, maps and roots. But studies again by Burgess and colleagues have shown oscillations between the two processes, with grid cells continually updating the appearance of landmarks when bodies move. Moreover, such updating obtains in both actual and imagined navigation. What they call dynamic spatial imagery helps us not only to plot our current locations, but also to construct future and fictional scenes. And thirdly, updating our cognitive map means updating our memories. In moving about, our location changes, but earlier memories of the spatial layout are being revised and complicated, not erased. The older model of memory theorized that recent memories are first consolidated in the hippocampus and then stored as long-term memories in the neocortex, from which they are retrieved every time we recollect the past. The newer model proposes that in recall, the hippocampus engages in memory reconsolidation. Storage and retrieval is enacted over and over again, and every new storage adds something new. As Yadin Dudai explains, the metaphorical storehouse of memory is now understood as a phoenix-like operation of continual rebirth and change. Phoenix-like processes inform our reading memory as well. As I've mentioned, narrative is generally cast as a linear form, word following word. But cognitively, the reader is always mentally recalling what has been read, and the new model of memory suggests the process of preserving remembered scenes, but also overlaying them and mixing them with new. Reconsolidations in spatial memory can thus create a layered and palimpsestic cognitive map. In Mrs. Dalloway, the composite map accrues from different places and different angles and through numerous bodily senses, visual, oral, and haptic. We can begin with the baseline of a topographical map of London in 1923, the year the novel is set. 
The allocentric representation here isn't quite viewer independent, since it was likely produced for tourists, and it depicts an urban dynamic that the novel's reference to place upholds, the contrast between Bond Street as a shopping area and the various public parks. The green and brown areas inscribe the variations between natural and built environments, indicating that the city affords opportunities for both noise and quiet, commerce and rest. Our cognitive map then overlays the base map with the various paths the characters take, interfacing the geographical terrain with the characters' movements, and so combining allocentric and egocentric maps and routes. Route mapping inscribes multiple patterns as well. The two main characters who never meet are nonetheless connected by a continuous trajectory from south to north. Clarissa's walk from Dean's yard to Bond Street, shown in red, is extended by Septimus's walk from Bond Street to Regent's Park, shown in pink. One character picks up where the other leaves off in one continuous path, and indeed these characters function as doubles in the plot. Introducing a second pattern, their combined trajectory is paralleled by Peter's route from Dean's Yard to Regent's Park, depicted in blue. To continuity and parallel, the map then adds convergence. The paths of Peter and Septimus collide in Regent's Park beside the circle in white at the top, where in a reverse shot, each man observes the other. Finally, minor characters add the pattern of overlap in space, but separation in time. Richard Dalloway, the, the yellow line, follows some of his wife's footsteps on his subsequent walk from Bond Street home. And their daughter Elizabeth, the green line starting at the bottom and going east, follows Peter up Victoria Street and Whitehall toward the Strand, but by bus and much later in the day. <clears throat> As conceptual schema, the cognitive map of London thus creates a palimpsest of continuity, parallel, convergence, and overlap. In addition to geography and character movement, sounds add layers of connectivity and networks as well. On the micro level, local small-scale sounds, the circles in bright green, bring people imaginatively together despite the literal separation of their lives. Although they never meet, Clarissa and Septimus are riveted by the same car backfiring in Bond Street. The song of an old woman at the Regent Park's tube station affects both Peter and Septimus's wife. And the ambulance bell connects Peter, although unknowingly, to the death of the man whose anguish he encountered earlier in the day. On the macro level, Big Ben is a loudly reverberating sound mark. Its chimes are heard by numerous characters dispersed throughout London. The airwaves it creates spread over the city, eventually dissipating into the sky. And finally, technology sculpts a connecting line. The flight of a sky-riding airplane, the orange line, bridges disparate parts of London and then breaches the borders of the city, soaring out over Greenwich to the distant fields and countryside. Setting aside the plot of Wolfe's novel, the point I want to make is this. We can be reading linear prose, but simultaneously constructing multidimensional, palimpsestic, time-layered mental maps. And the existence of non-attentional modes of cognition suggests we can perceptually grasp a layered and cumulative spatial image without consciously noting or analyzing it in the way that I'm doing now. Imagining space can give us the bodily experience of being in it, activating the neural networks that we use when inhabiting space in our lives. Like the subjects who didn't realize that their cross-cutting eye movements were giving them the problem-solving strategy, our cognitive mapping of London gives us a way to think. In Wolfe's novel, we experience London not as a place of alienation, as is so often claimed about modern cities, but as a space of encounters and networks, replete with connections and potential connections, including those that are missed or ignored. We hear the city's constantly shifting rhythms, grasping the way movements and sounds add layers of density, turning a flat plane into a multigrid 
As my final map indicates, the density of information becomes admittedly too great for legible, for legible representation in two-dimensional cartography. But it could be easily represented with three-dimensional interactive digital techniques. And indeed, Wolf's modeling of urban space anticipates the complex network models that are on the cusp of city planning today. Bottom-up, as well as top-down processes, movements emanating from multiple centers, change at the local level affecting the whole in more than simply additive ways. In sum, a multi-level, interactive, networked grid. The London underground map from the, from the 30s speaks to the city's complexity, but organized and flattened into a two-dimensional plane. Wolf's multi-dimensional mobile model anticipates a time when transport networks will think for themselves. And I have to say, I was going to a conference and I saw that ad in the airport and I had to stop and take a picture of it. Uh, and also the kind of smart city that Alphabet Sidewalks Lab envisions for Waterfront Toronto. If working with complex systems is becoming increasingly necessary, are there ways then that narrative can play a useful role? Some educators argue that it's difficult to teach complex systems when the prevailing educational mode privileges linear sequential thinking, and that students need the bodily experience of complex systems before attempting theoretical grasp. Reading narrative can give such experience by activating the kinds of dynamic spatial imagery I've shown. And it's not only the predominance of linear thinking that narrative might help to correct. Neuroscientific evidence is suggesting that reliance on GPS devices suppresses activity in the hippocampus, reducing our navigational capacities. Given the hippocampus's crucial role in both spatial and mental navigation, narrative's rich and flexible imaginative scene construction may answer an increasing deficit in our world. And so wrapping up. I don't want to leave the impression that complexity thinking is my single goal. Flexibility of mind is what matters, and that means the ability to think in a variety of ways. We get mental exercise by reading works with internal complexities, but we gain broader flexibility by reading a wide range of authors and inhabiting radically different story minds. And such continuing mental movement may help to preserve our potentials for choice. I'm also advancing a broader role for art than the conception adopted in some of the work in neuroscience, proposing that the essence of art is to move us in personal, individual ways. There are indeed times when art gives us pleasure by appearing, appealing to our personal emotions and values. But at least equally valuable is the way art can take us temporarily out of ourselves and into foreign, even alien ground. We learn the experience of thinking otherwise, an ability useful in dealing with change or conflict, and for understanding the cognitive frames of others from the inside. We may return to our preferred cognitive modes after our reading, but most likely in enriched, more empathetic ways. And finally, my attempts to bring art and si arts and science together are founded on the belief that we gain broader perspectives from interfacing related but differing disciplinary fields. The project is, of course, not new. The Society for Literature, Science, and the Arts, it should be noted, has passed its 30th year. But we need to go further into the border zones, locating areas where the questions and speculations in our disciplines both meet and collide, and where the paths we would traditionally take for our answers become, in the process, subtly changed. Neuroscience and psychology have stimulated my own thinking and I can hope that my speculations, quirky applications, and occasional pushbacks will stimulate new speculations in return. And most certainly, stretching our minds into the foreign language of another discipline is in itself an excellent exercise for the cognitively flexible reading brain. Thank you. <laughs>